Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is a pro-revenge story. For context, in my country, if your package gets sent through the National Post Service, you're basically screwed. It takes forever and they never actually deliver it. I don't know how it is in other countries, but here they're supposed to ring the doorbell if the package doesn't fit the mailbox. If you don't answer, they leave a notice and you have to go pick it up all the way at the post office. The problem is that my mailman doesn't even try to deliver them. He just leaves the notice without ringing the doorbell and leaves. I've had to pick up nearly every package I've ordered because of that. Well, the last time was my last straw. I was obviously home because of the recent health crisis. Suddenly I received a call that immediately hung up. It was so fast that my phone didn't even ring, just showed up as a missed call. No doorbell, nothing. I suspected it was the mailman, and ran to the door only to find him inside the truck, looking straight at me before driving off. I was fuming and called the post office to file a complaint. I explained the situation to the customer service rep, Sarah. I'm sorry, but we can't file a complaint, Sarah said. Our carriers are only instructed to ring the doorbell. Calling is optional and you can't prove that he didn't ring it. But he didn't even attempt to deliver the package, I protested. I understand your frustration, but without evidence, there's nothing we can do, Sarah replied firmly. At first, I just avoided using them again at all costs, but last month I ordered something and chose a delivery company from the ones listed on the website. Apparently, that company hires the National Post Service to deliver for them here. When I found out, I basically stalked the tracking info for days. It was about two weeks late, of course. Until one day late at night, it said it had arrived in my country, which usually means that the next day, it's going to be delivered. The next day, I woke up at 7 a.m. to check. My suspicions were correct, it said, out for delivery. I quickly grabbed something to eat, got in my car, and parked right outside my house. Then I waited, and waited, and waited... Five hours in total until I finally saw the post truck pulling over. I grabbed my phone to record and watched as the mailman, let's call him Jake, opened the door already with the notice in hand, slid it inside my mailbox and turned around. I got out of the car and said, Excuse me, what are you doing? Jake didn't even look at me and mumbled, Just delivering packages, miss. Then I stood there as that jerk grabbed his phone to call me and quickly hung up. I smiled as I took my phone out of my pocket and sarcastically stated, Oh, bummer, you didn't even give me time to reach for the phone. Jake literally turned white. He couldn't even speak. I continued, Now can you give me my package, please? He quickly opened the truck, almost tripped, and took out my package. See, wasn't that easier than your whole scheme? I asked, raising an eyebrow. Jake finally managed to stammer, Sorry, miss, I... I didn't think anyone was home. That's why you're supposed to ring the doorbell, I pointed out. It's literally your job. He nodded sheepishly, handed me the package, and hurried back to his truck. He probably thought he got lucky I didn't say anything else, but little did he know that I sent the video to the post office via email attached to my complaint. Well, let's just say I have a new mailman now. This one tries to leave one second after ringing the doorbell, but at least he rings. The other day, I saw him practically sprinting back to his truck after dropping off a package. Hey! I called out. You don't have to run. I appreciate that you actually ring the bell now. He paused, looking surprised. Oh, uh, thanks. I just heard about what happened to the last guy. I couldn't help but laugh. Don't worry. I only go after the ones who don't do their job. You're safe. He smiled, looking relieved, and waved goodbye. It's nice to finally have a mailman who does his job, even if he's a bit skittish. Maybe one day he'll even stick around long enough for me to learn his name. The next one is an entitled people story. I never thought I'd see the day when someone would try to kick me out of my own company, but that's exactly what happened last month. I'm the founder and CEO of a mid-sized tech firm that I built from the ground up over the last 15 years. We've had our ups and downs, but overall business has been good and we've grown steadily. About a year ago, I decided to bring on a new operations manager to help streamline things as we continued to expand. Enter Karen, a woman in her late 40s with an impressive resume and references. She seemed great in the interviews, confident, articulate, full of ideas. I was excited to have her on board. For the first few months, things went pretty smoothly. Karen implemented some new processes that helped improve efficiency, and she seemed to get along well with the rest of the team. But looking back, there were some red flags I should have paid more attention to. She had a tendency to overstep her authority, making decisions without consulting me or other executives. When called out on it, she'd get defensive and claim she was just being proactive. 
She also started subtly undermining me in meetings, contradicting my plans, or suggesting alternatives in a way that made me look unprepared. I chalked it up to growing pains and figured we just needed time to find our groove working together. Boy, was I wrong. Things came to a head when I returned from a two-week business trip to Europe. I'd been meeting with potential investors and partners, laying the groundwork for our expansion into new markets. It was an exciting and productive trip, and I came back energized and ready to hit the ground running. Imagine my shock when I walked into the office that Monday morning and found Karen sitting at my desk in my private office. She looked up with a smug smile and said, Oh, you're back. We need to talk. I was confused and caught off guard. Um, yes we do, starting with why you're in my office. She waved her hand dismissively. Oh, that. Well, since you were gone for so long, I decided to move in here. It just makes more sense for day-to-day -day operations. Don't worry, I had your things moved to one of the smaller offices down the hall. I stood there in disbelief, trying to process what I was hearing. Was this some kind of joke? Karen, this is my office. I'm the CEO. You can't just decide to take it over because I was away on a business trip. She rolled her eyes. Look, I know you started this company, but let's be real. I'm the one actually running things now. The board agrees that it's time for some changes around here. Your management style is outdated and inefficient. We need fresh blood at the top. Now I was getting angry. What are you talking about? What board? We don't have a board of directors. Karen smirked. We do now. I've been talking to the other executives and some key investors. We all agree it's time to professionalize the leadership structure here. You'll be transitioned to an advisory role, and I'll be taking over as CEO. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This woman I'd hired less than a year ago was trying to stage some kind of coup and oust me from my own company. That's ridiculous, I sputtered. You have no authority to do any of this. I'm still the majority shareholder and CEO. Now get out of my office before I call security. Karen's face hardened. I was hoping you'd be reasonable about this. But if you want to make things difficult, fine. I've already spoken to building management. They'll be here shortly to escort you out. Your keycard access has been revoked. Sure enough, a few minutes later, two security guards from the building management company showed up. Karen must have been planning this for weeks. This man is trespassing and needs to be removed from the premises, she told them with a smug smile. I was absolutely livid at this point. Are you insane? I own this company. I'm not going anywhere. The guards looked uncomfortable and confused. One of them said, Sir, we're just following orders from building management. They said your access has been revoked. By who? I demanded. Check your records. I'm the tenant of record for this entire floor. I sign your checks every month. While this confrontation was going on, a small crowd of employees had gathered to watch the drama unfold. I spotted my assistant Jenny in the group and called her over. Jenny, please pull up our corporate documents and lease agreement right now, I instructed her. She nodded and hurried off. I turned back to Karen. This little power play of yours isn't going to work. You have no legal authority here, she sneered. We'll see about that. I have documents of my own showing the change in leadership. The lease and everything else will be updated soon. Jenny returned a few minutes later with a stack of papers. I quickly found the relevant documents and thrust them at the security guards. Here, this proves I'm the owner and CEO of this company, as well as the legal tenant for this office space. You have no grounds to remove me. The guards examined the papers, looking increasingly uncomfortable. One of them pulled out his radio and called his supervisor. While we waited for the supervisor to arrive, I addressed the gathered employees. I want to assure everyone that I am still very much in charge here. Any communications or directives from Karen regarding changes in leadership are completely false and should be disregarded. I could see the confusion and concern on people's faces. This kind of drama and uncertainty was the last thing the company needed. The building manager showed up about ten minutes later. After reviewing all the documentation, he profusely apologized for the mix-up. I'm so sorry about this, sir. We received some documents that appeared to show a change in tenancy, but clearly they were fraudulent. Of course, you have full access to the premises. We'll be launching a full investigation into how this happened. I nodded, my anger now focused squarely on Karen. Thank you. I think I know exactly how it happened. I turned to the security guards. Please escort Ms. Karen out of the building. She is fired effective immediately and is no longer permitted on the premises. Karen's smug facade finally cracked. You can't do this. I have contracts, agreements with the other executives. You'll be hearing from my lawyer. I smiled coldly. Looking forward to it.
I'm sure they'll be very interested to hear about your attempted corporate takeover and fraud. Now get out of my office. As the guards led her away, I breathed a sigh of relief. But I knew the drama was far from over. The next few weeks were a whirlwind of damage control. I had to reassure employees, clients, and investors that the company was stable and that the attempted coup had been shut down. We also had to do a full audit to see what other mischief Karen had been up to. It turned out she had indeed been conspiring with a couple of other executives, promising them big promotions and equity stakes if they backed her takeover attempt. They were promptly fired as well. Karen tried to sue for wrongful termination, but her case was laughed out of court once all the evidence of her schemes came to light. She's now facing criminal charges for fraud and forging corporate documents. In the end, the whole ordeal actually made the company stronger. It exposed some weak links in the organization and allowed me to bring in new talent that was truly a Aligned with our vision and values, we've since had our best quarter ever and are moving full steam ahead with our expansion plans. Looking back, I still can't believe the audacity of what Karen tried to pull. It was a stark reminder to trust my instincts, pay attention to red flags, and always stay vigilant, even with the people you think you can trust. But it also showed me how resilient the company I built is and how many great, loyal people we have on the team. I learned some valuable lessons from the whole fiasco. I've put better checks and balances in place, improved our hiring and vetting processes, and made sure our corporate governance is rock solid. No one will ever be able to pull something like that again. It's been a wild ride, but I'm proud of how we handled it and came out stronger on the other side. Just another chapter in the crazy story of building and running a business. Now if you'll excuse me, I have a company to run from my rightful office. The next one is a petty revenge story. Back when I was around 15, our cousin came to live with us. He was a real piece of work, and we had the misfortune of our mom being too kind and taking him in. I noticed that my cologne and deodorant was being used and asked him if he was using it. He denied it. We were the only males other than my stepdad, and I knew he wasn't using it because we had separate bathrooms, and my cousin sister and I shared one. Had he admitted it, it wouldn't have been as big of a deal, but the blatant lying infuriated me. So I decided to take take action. My deodorant was speed stick, which is moderately translucent. Icy hot looks very similar. So I backed down the deodorant and filled the recess with icy hot. Lo and behold, the next morning my cousin comes into the kitchen crying because his armpits were burning. I began laughing hysterically and said that's what you get for using my crap. He tried getting me in trouble, but my mom said the same thing. He never used my stuff again. A few years later, this same cousin found the keys to my car and stole it. He was caught because when he backed up at Q gas station, he hit one of the posts that protect the pumps and got stuck. He got sent to juvenile detention for that. My car was taken another time too, and we suspect it was him as both times keys were used, but that time it was just abandoned. Had I gotten my hands on him, the revenge would have been a little more nuclear. The next one is a malicious compliance story. Back in maybe 2006-2008-ish, I was a tax associate at the most well-known tax service in North America. I did very well in the class you take, which determines your eligibility to be hired as well as teaching you how to do taxes, and was hired. I bounced from office to office as newbies do, and I was doing well enough that I was always the first to be called if a shift needed covered. After my first season with them went so well, I was invited back for the next year and the class was free because of the invitation back. In case you wonder why the class is every year, it's because tax rules change every year and we have to keep up. Shortly after the class was over, which I aced, I was approached by the lady who ran the district. She wanted to open a seasonal office in a Walmart 50 Cullimer outside the city I worked in. She wanted me as a primary associate there, in part because I'd done so well in the previous year, in part because I'd aced the class, in part because of my background in security, and in part because I live 20 kilometers closer to this Walmart than anyone else on staff. I wasn't to be a manager, but I was going to be the only full-time one associate. I'd open and close almost every day, and often be the only associate on site. It was basically my baby to take care of. There were hints it might lead to advancement in the company as well. I was pretty excited at the opportunity. At first everything was great. The Walmart staff liked me, the customers liked me, my boss liked me. I was blasting through customers. Only maybe five people walked away due to having to wait out of the few hundred who approached my little office beside the produce section. Two months in, right before the tax season really heated up, I had a weekend I'd booked off the same day they'd hired me. I was going out of the province to see family. 
Trip had been set long before they hired me and I'd made it quite clear I wasn't going to be around. The schedule accurately reflected that. So weekend arrives and I go. Had a good time, came home Monday evening so I could be back Tuesday morning. When I got home, I checked my answering machine for messages. Even if smartphones were starting to be a thing, I didn't have one. And I'm pleased to say I still don't. There was three messages. Two from my boss, the district lady, and one from the scheduler. I don't remember everything word for word, so I'll paraphrase message 1, Saturday morning, approximately 7 a.m. Hi, Venasia, sorry to do this to you, but we need you in today. Employee X, who we scheduled to replace you's car, broke down. Message 2, Saturday afternoon, approximately 2 p.m. I'm very disappointed in you for not responding to me and not showing up. I'll be making some changes. Message 3, Monday morning, approximately 9 a.m. Hi, Venasia, this is Scheduler. Your hours have changed this week. Call me when you get this. Now, at this point in my life, I'm not a kid out of high school, and I've had enough experience with screw jobs that I'm absolutely not going to crawl on my hands and knees apologizing and begging for my job. If you're going to be petty and mean, just because you ducked up, then we're going to have problems. And so we did. I called the scheduler and was told I was suspended for a week and to call my boss after a week to get back on the schedule. She said the boss was trying to put me in my place and teach me how to be a good manager. I'd get back on the schedule after the week was over. I brought up my pre-planned and scheduled time off, and also that I wasn't a manager, I was a regular employee. The scheduler was very uncomfortable, but she was only doing what she was told. They did need me, she said, just call boss in a week. I said sure, and then didn't. I was furious, and I wasn't the one who was going to be put in her place. I called a few of the customers who I'd been working with and explained I was no longer working there, and they chose to keep my as their tax gap regardless. It really wasn't intended as revenge, even though it sounds that way. The company wasn't going to make more than it cost to have someone do their taxes anyway. This was purely a customer relationship thing. I like to finish what I start. The real revenge was accepting my suspension. The entire week I was suspended, I made sure to stop in at the Walmart to see if I knew who they scheduled for my shift and if we were friendly, then help them out with the quirks of this location. But there was never anyone there. I confirmed with the Walmart staff all week they had no one working there. Paying Walmart to rent space and getting nothing but a bad reputation for it because the heavily advertised new location had zero employees. It remained that way for the rest of the season. Two months. The boss never called me and I never called her. Pride. I have no idea how it impacted her professionally. I stayed far away from taxes ever since. I got another job before my suspension was over and never looked back. The next one is an entitled people's story. So I met my one friend Pamela during college in 2018 and we became instant friends. A year later I befriended a girl named Jasmine. At the time, Pamela and Jasmine didn't know each other. Years later, I introduced Pamela and Jasmine and they became instant friends. I have to say that Jasmine is more obsessed with Pamela, and Pamela doesn't show any sign of obsession towards Jasmine. In some ways, I started to feel as if Jasmine preferred Pamela over me since she always complimented Pamela and told her that she's so beautiful when she rarely compliments me. Jasmine met her boyfriend back in 2022 and it's been horrible ever since. She has told me she thinks he's cheating on her, how emotionally abusive he is towards her, the way he screams at her, and that he encouraged her to not take birth control and that they have unprotected intimacy. So from what she told me, I never had a liking towards this guy. But they always break up just to get back together so this guy isn't going anywhere. My friend goes from crying over what he says and does to being so happy in a state of euphoria. It's a constant up and down of emotions. Pamela knew about Jasmine and her relationship problems. Pamela is very brutally honest and that's part of who she is. She has also expressed dislike towards Pamela's boyfriend, but she's more honest and brutal about than I am. Jasmine led Pamela to believe that they broke up in August. When I was hanging out with Pamela a few months back, she mentioned that Jasmine told her that they broke up. I was surprised because the day before Jasmine told me about her Valentine's Day plans with the boyfriend. I said to Pamela, What do you mean they are still together? And she explained to me that Jasmine told her they broke up in August. I was completely shocked and confused. I told her that they are still together. Few days later, I asked Jasmine why did she lie to Pamela. I said to her that Pamela has the impression you and your boyfriend broke up and asked if that happened. She looked completely panicked and said, I wasn't ready to tell her the truth. I told her she can't lie to her and leave so much detail out from her and that if she wants a friendship with her then she needs to be honest. 
She didn't say much, but just said that she will tell Pamela when she's ready, and that she feels the relationship won't last that long. A while ago, we all went out for dinner to celebrate my birthday. My brother happened to join us, and he knows about my friend's relationship with her boyfriend. I told him about Jasmine lying to Pamela, so he put her on the spot in front of everyone that was there and asked her how her relationship is going. She went quiet and told him that they broke up and that they weren't meant to be. I didn't say anything to stop him, and I feel a bit bad for letting him put her on the spot. It was awkward because I know they are still together. Jasmine's brother, who is also there, knows they are still together. My brother knows they are together, and now my friend Pamela knows she's being lied to. Earlier today, Jasmine and I were discussing plans to see Pamela on Friday. I told her after a lot of debate that I don't feel comfortable being in the middle of her lying to Pamela about her relationship. She said that it's not a lie if it's never brought up to her. I told her that's not the point, because what if one day it comes up? She said she doesn't see the relationship lasting that long, and that's why she didn't tell Pamela. I told her that's bullcrap because he's done so many horrible things to her, and she's not getting rid of him. I even said their relationship most likely will outlive my relationship. She went very quiet, and I just told her, Look, I'm not lying for you anymore. You need to tell Pamela whenever it comes time, but I can't be caught in the middle of a lie. She didn't say much after that, but I wonder was I wrong for telling her I'm not covering up for her lies to my other friend? Thank you for watching, I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.